art and skateboarding. I've always had a, a really connected relationship. A lot of popularized clothing options nowadays, graphic t-shirts and stuff, uh, owe a lot of that to skateboarding and the graphics that were produced by incredible artists that went on different pro models. It's always interesting to, to consider too where skateboarding is kind of a subculture um, and there's a lot of influence in that with different art forms uh, like different street art and graffiti. There's sort of a rebellious aspect of it that kind of uh, it nurtures creative people and kind of gives them a really interesting outlet to uh, experiment and play with. We were looking around the city and noticing that there was a really vibrant skate culture that didn't necessarily seem to have a really solid stronghold or point where they could come and meet and collaborate and share and so we decided that with all these talented and creative people like we really wanted to give them a space to kind of come together and collaborate and work on projects so it's much more than just a retail shop we really work to encourage people to come in and meet other skaters and go out and share tricks and different styles that they have as well as working on creative projects you know some board shapes speak to people and the graphics do not so we like to offer uh, different graphic schemes we have a, a full working art production facility in the back where we can customize graphics and shape boards or we do a lot of refurbishment. Um, it's a very uh, DIY or do-it-yourself based culture where we really encourage people to, to come in and experiment and not just accept products the way they are but make them the way they want that really kind of uh, reflect their personalities and their interests. Skateboarding really originated as we know it when, with the invention of the urethane skate wheel in the late 70s. That's what turned it into a legitimate form of transportation versus just a toy. You know? And then that kind of led to the first boom, public skate parks open. There's a lot of emphasis on for-profit skate parks uh, through the 70s. Kind of the first death of skateboarding was around 1980, and then you really didn't see uh, skateboarding picking back up till the mid 80s. Basically the skateboard industry was really born through that period from the 1980s through the early 90s at which point everything died again <laughs> and then about four or five years later it was back in the public eye again with things like the X Games yeah. and uh, some of the video games Tony Hawk Pro Skater, a lot of that stuff put things back in front of people. It's really been booming ever since. It's bigger than ever. The goal for the Alchemy Indoor Skate Park and the Education Center is to foster community by way of skateboarding. There's a lot of resources these kids have to offer the community. I mean, they're natural problem solvers, they're very, very intelligent, uh, but through a lot of our, our research we find that 56 or 57 percent of these kids are dropping out of high school. So there's a disconnect between them and the mainstream or dominant culture in this area. Uh, that is a huge problem when we have all like this huge resource, but it's not being accessed. So the whole mission of Alchemy is to show the community one that we can, these kids, these people, this community, this subculture has ability to make things great in Tacoma, not solve all the problems, you know, by any means, but but to step in the right direction. It's a, it's an overlooked group has been overlooked for a while. So uh, we want to partner with the school district and show kids that they can get PE credit for skateboarding. Instead of thinking skateboarding and school can't go together or I can't transfer my skills from skateboarding into my education, you know, now they're going to be a little more accepted. Um, and it's still, still fun. One of the things that's unique about Tacoma, especially within the Northwest, is there's so many possibilities. The story's not written, it's being written. And so there's a willingness, I think, to explore new ideas, to move in new directions, to take chances, you know? And I think that's an invaluable resource. I think that's a, 
a cultural element that is compatible with skateboarding and the skateboarding culture. You know, this idea that we can invent it for ourselves, that we can create it, that we can find community partners, that you know, we can do something new or different, we can learn from other people's successes and failures. You know, for us, the ball's really just getting rolling. creates tremendous possibilities. My name is April Nyquist and my art form is multimedia and dance. I describe myself as a resistant artist. I, for a long time, hated that word. I did not want to be called an artist at all. I thought it came with a really huge responsibility, which it does. At this phase of my life, it's moved from resistant to, okay, I'm gonna jump in and collaborate with people, and I'm very much in a new stage of artistry and art exploration. Right now we are at the Hug Farm. It is a local community farm. It is organized by volunteers who maintain the space and communication with the neighbors. Hug stands for Hilltop Urban Gardens. Our mission is to promote economic and racial justice through food. The best part about this space and the people that work here is we're really mindful about the seasons and how winter is the ideal time for planning and we can really honor that and really give into the dream phase and visioning phase of our process. And so I have all of these bits and pieces of works that are just like, they're the seeds. They're like ready to be launched and, and fertilized and, and harvested. I, I was always kind of coming up with stories and telling stories and even when I was maybe three or four years old I would tell these stories to my mom and ask her to type them up for me uh, so that she could print them up and I could illustrate the pictures and um, so really ever since I could talk I was telling stories. I kind of got more serious or had more focus with my writing when I was a teenager and started to seriously consider, you know, wanting to do it as a career someday. And for that, I wrote what's called fan fiction for about 10 years of my life. And fan fiction is when you take an existing story from like a book or a movie or, or a television show and you write stories using that world and those characters. And then I had the idea for Cinder and decided, okay, this is it. This is going to be my first novel, or at least I'm going to try to be, make it my first novel. The idea for it actually started with a fan fiction that I wrote. I had heard about a writing contest that was happening on a fan fiction website. In order to enter, you had to choose two things from her list and include them in a short story. The two things that I chose were that I was going to set my story in the future and include a fairy tale character. And I ended up writing this science fiction retelling of the fairy tale Puss in Boots. My story was one of only two stories that had been entered into the contest, uh, and it came in second place. <laughs> um, but I came away from that thinking, oh, that was so much fun to write. I really loved combining these two genres, um, you know, fairy tales and science fiction. It seemed like they had absolutely nothing in common, uh, but I thought that there was a lot of potential there and I could do something with that. It took me about two years to write and from when I finished writing it and started submitting it to agents, it was about three months then before I had a book deal. It was very, very fast and, and I was very surprised and of course elated.
full-time writer. I'm a partner in Side by Side Creative, a marketing company my wife and I own together. I'm on the Parks Board of Tacoma and then writing. So some days I might be just writing furiously all day and other days I might not get to it because I've got other two jobs going. I started writing in grade school and I had this vision of being a grade school bestseller and I wrote an 80 page novel. Novel. I thought it was great and then I wrote a sequel and then I wrote a sequel and then I actually had a real novel because it was longer than 80 pages. Um, and that was the thing that kept me going because anytime I got stuck on any later work, I was like, you did this in middle school, why can't you do it now? I actually really have three genres that I've written in. I have three mystery novels, a series, it's a computer hacker who becomes a detective and his adventures. I have two guidebooks for nonprofits, fundraising and social media. And then I'm starting a science fiction trilogy. The first book came out in October. That one's been very exciting because it's, a, it's an adventure with global stakes and I haven't written anything like that before. I'm self-published. The new word that people are using to sound less self-published like is independent publishing. It used to be that you would look down your nose at self-publishing. It was pretty accurately called vanity publishing because you would pay $20,000 and you'd get a, a, you know, 500 books in your basement and they'd never move anywhere because there was no distribution method. There was no way to get them out except for selling them one by one in the trunk of your car, practically. Everything changed with the Kindle, with the rise of eBooks. For practically free, my wife is a, is a graphic designer, so she designs my covers. I format the books as eBooks. I can upload them to the Kindle. I can upload them as a print book. And I only pay if someone buys it. So I don't have to have 500 books in the basement. I wrote fan fiction for a long, long time, many, many years. Which books? Uh, Sailor Moon, actually. Are you familiar? Not really. No? Um, oh, you're missing out. <laughs> you need to get in touch with okay. your teenage okay. girl side. Sailor Moon was a, a Japanese anime, very like magic girl, superhero type. Lots of fun. Um, anyway, so I'd, I'd, you know, experienced time and again, um, you know, the, the flash of, of inspiration, yeah. like I have to write that, uh, but it had always been for fan fiction. And so this was the first time where I had an idea for an original novel that I was so excited about. Uh, and it was like, I have to write that. I have yeah. to try to get it published and see what happens. So. And it worked out. It worked <laughs> out. Yeah. How about that? It's it, it, quite miraculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I started not thinking that I would be writing mysteries and science fiction because it seemed I don't want to say lowbrow, but I was like an English major and I was reading mm. all these like great books and convoluted timelines with, you know, cyclical structures and I thought that's <laughs> what I should be writing. Right, symbolism. Yeah, oh, just dripping with symbolism. <laughs> um, and I, I wrote that, like that's what I wrote for so long. And then I, you know, got jobs and I couldn't keep that going on the side. And so after a few years had gone by, I thought if I can finish a novel in a month, it's gotta be genre. Like that's the only way I'm gonna have a chance is like genre friction to let's just like go. And that's how The Saints Go Dying came out. It's like a serial killer in LA and a detective has to stop him. Like, you know, dun dun dun. Yeah, <laughs> like right. that, and that's that's what it took. And suddenly I was like, I like this. Like I like the genre fiction and I like the fun because that's what I grew up reading. I think about writing as, as this room is a great example, as like interior decorating. Because it's like, it might be a great couch and it's it's just bad for the room. Mm -hmm. So when I'm trying to decide what I'm writing, it's like, I love this scene, I love this moment or this character. I either need to change the entire room to make it work or the couch has got to go. Right. So that's that kind of how, way to think, how about I think about it. it. And if you have to get rid of something you love, you know, you might be able to use it as a deleted scene on a blog somewhere or something. That's a really that's good point. That's kind of how I always try to comfort myself when you have to get rid, rid of that scene. It'll it's be like an, an extra perk for the fans yeah, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, like it didn't quite fit with the book, but I know you want to read it. Right. Do you think you'll ever do any extras? Do you have all this back history in your mind? I, you I have a lot of it. Um, and I've, I've toyed with the idea for the lead cloak of having like a short story set from one of the main characters, like, you know, how she became like she is, I guess, similar to what you're thinking. Like, you know, here's the backstory, here's a pivotal scene. Um, but part of me likes having the secrets, like knowing the things that, that never make it into the book because it makes 
it makes me feel like they're a little bit more rounded. Like, mm -hmm. like I, I'm not, it's like if you put it out all on the page, then that's all there is. And But if I know things about the character that inform them that the reader doesn't totally get, maybe that makes them feel like a little bit more of a real person. Right. I, I don't know. No, I know what you're saying. I also, I do appreciate those moments when like a reader will ask me a question about you know, the world building or the character background, and I actually have an answer for it. And I'm like, oh, you don't know this, but let me tell you. And then I get really excited. I feel like I know right. what I'm doing. There's actually a flaw in my world building. Oh, no. I you know. Don't, don't say it now. Oh, I'm going to, I have to tell you now. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. I'm proud of it. It, it is what it is. Um, but the thing is, technology wise, in the books, um, they're not that far in the future. It's not really that advanced technology. Um, you know, even like Cinder's cyborg makeup and, and a lot of these things, pretty much based on things that we're working toward right now. Um, so like on that level, maybe one or 200 years in the future. Uh, but then I have this, you know, society of mutant people living on the moon right. and, you know, evolution, very slow process. <laughs> um, so those two things are kind of at odds, hence my, my made up time period in that, the future. That's your flaw? That's not a flaw. Well, it's, it's that's a fiction. fiction. That's it's fiction. fiction. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Couldn't have said it that, better that's myself. That's what it's for. Yes, but that's, people ask me, well, I always want to know, how far in the future is it? I don't know. After the Fourth yes, World War. Yes, let me explain to you my conundrum. Yeah. So, even if Tacoma's not in there, do you have the, the 253 pride? I do. I love Tacoma. Um, I've actually, I mean, are you I, from here? I am born okay. and raised and both of my, my husband born and raised in Tacoma. Both of our parents are all of our parents born and raised in Tacoma. We're, we're Tacoma people. Well, and, and I think that it's interesting. I mean, there's an assumption that New York Times bestselling author is going to go move to some glamorous place <laughs> and, you know, leave Tacoma behind and, and, you know, come back when, you know, to snip a ribbon on a right. building or something <laughs> like that at, at PLU. But. I think that, that it's a good creative community. I do too. Now I have, I mean obviously we'll see what the future holds, but I have no intention um, of moving right now. And then of course we're the home of Frank Herbert. Who True. Who is, <laughs> yeah. you know, a, a sci-fi legend and so that's yeah. always, mm -hmm. uh, I think he's, he's still the big feather in our cap, yeah. literary wise. Definitely. But mm -hmm. yeah. And this was great. This it was, was really fun. wonderful to have a nice conversation and to talk, with you. to talk writer stuff. Yeah. yeah. So my name's uh, Eddie Sumlin, but people when I'm performing know me as a uh, DJ by the name of Mr. Melanin. How you doing? What's up, brother? Good to see you, man. I like to do things different. I like to create different environments. I like to, to throw different types of parties that bring different groups of people together. And you know, it, it's always fun. And I want people to have a new experience. Why I chose Gallery of Ambition, I mean, when I look about this slice of downtown, it's like ninth quarter, so much great history. To the left of us, we've got Moss and Mineral, which was one of my favorite stores. Around the corner, we've got Feather and Ore. Like, there's just so much good stuff. And Dion and, and what he brings to, to, to Gallery of Ambition is an energy that I really like. Everybody, like, come together mantra is just something that I really identify with, you know? And just by the person he is and the space that he creates, it, it really, it really uh, fosters that, you know? Anybody can come in here and, and, and get in the mix, you know. That's what I like about him, you know. There's been lots of people, there's been like artists who just come in here and like, yeah, I, I, I paint. And Dion's like, well, well, just bring your paintings and I'll throw them on the wall. I'm like, that, you know, like, like, I like that there's just immediate action and there's energy. That's what I think about this space, it's energy, just like raw energy. Whenever I'm downtown, this is like a spot I have to like stop in before I go on to my next destination, you know. Like, I might go get a cup of coffee. Uh, and then it's just like, when I walk into my car, I'll stop in here. There's been times here I've only anticipated for being here for one minute. I've been here for like one and a half or two hours. So it's just like, it's, there's no typical experience at Gallery of Ambition, but it's always, it's always fun, always interesting. <laughs> For me, it arose from going to college and just cutting loose and being wild. It's all, it's all about the taste. It's all about the taste. Um, personally, I'm a beer geek. 
I really developed a passion for the local beer scene, the beer industry. Business is not my thing. If I, if, yeah, if I did it, I would probably just give it all away. It's a passion for a lot of us. Craft beer for me is uh, it's a quality local product um, that you enjoy, that may inspire you. Craft beer um, is something that's been debated a lot, but in general what it means is beer with flavor. If you ask the Brewers Association, you're going to get a different definition. They're going to talk about the size of the brewery, who owns the brewery, but basically, um, as far as the customer is concerned, it's flavorful beer. It's an artisanal style of beer, which doesn't really answer the question of craft beer, but what it, what it does mean, um, especially to somebody like me, is it's small batches of high quality beer. It's probably not the same beer every day. It's something new and exciting. Um, I'm always looking for something different every time I go to a local pub or something like that. I'm always trying to see something different from a different brewery or something. Not only is it an explosion of craft brewing in, in the entire United States, but especially here uh, in the South Sound and in the city of Tacoma. Five, ten years ago, we were you know, maybe at 1,900 breweries in, in America. Uh, right now, we're over 3,000. I mean, this is the most breweries that we've ever had as a nation, period. There's a huge resurgence going on right now, and it doesn't show any signs of slowing down. Um, and I think it's connected with a lot of things. You know, a lot of people are more interested in drinking local. There's a, a lot of creativity going on. I mean, it's like cooking. People, people love flavorful food, and they can get it anywhere. But people are also realizing they love flavorful beer, but they can't necessarily get it everywhere. So as long as that unsatisfied demand exists, I think craft beer is going to continue to grow. You know, I go out to a, a white tablecloth restaurant, a really nice restaurant, and I, you see more people drinking beer than wine. Um, you're seeing a lot more food trends. You're seeing that culture of beer geekiness, for lack of a better word. Uh, we started about uh, almost three years ago now. We started out uh, brewing one barrel at a time, um, which is about 31 gallons at a time, super small. Uh, we were one of the smallest breweries in Washington for the last two years. Oh, small. So we're nano breweries. So um, it's a one barrel system, which is about 30 gallons per batch. Our capacity really is about 2,700 barrels, which sounds like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, if you look at um, other larger breweries, they're doing 30,000 barrels or 40,000 barrels. When we decided to, to start a brewery here in Tacoma, we wanted to uh, bring back some of the rich history of, uh, of brewing history of Tacoma. And for us, a logical choice was specific brewing and malting. Uh, because uh, when they went out of business uh, prior to, or in Prohibition in 1960 in the state, it was one of the, uh, the largest in the state, the second largest brewery in the state. So we thought it was a great fit. My inkling as a brewer is to stay as local as possible. To me, that's the purpose. We want to be a, a Tacoma craft brewery, and we want to primarily serve Tacoma. In order to make beer, um, a brewer needs to be both artistic and scientific. Kind of go, picking a style first. Do you want to make an IPA, a stout? Um, what kind of style that you want to make? And then the flavor profiles of that. Do you want to make one that's real hoppy, one that's real sweet? I would say about 90% is scientific and the other 10 is art. Uh, so if you can come up with a good recipe, be innovative, yeah, I think that's a lot, has to do a lot with the creative part. Do you want to have uh, fruit in it? Um, all kinds of different um, things like that that you'll start putting together to, to build the recipe and get the finished product. There's over 400 different varieties of beer. Each one is so unique to the next. Um, on top of that, you have all these breweries. And no breweries brew the same beer. Um, there might be some similarities, but there's always going to be that really nice, unique character. And my, my love is to find those unique characters Cellar. See what it tastes like. See what it tastes like in a couple months. You have foodies. I'm a beer. -y. We're at Narrows Brewing, and we're doing an all Tacoma Brewers collaboration beer, and it's a dark Belgian IPA. What we're trying to do is really build a brand for the city of Tacoma. We've got us. We've got Tacoma Brewing, Pacific Brewing and Malting. We've got Wingman, we've got Harmon, and we've got Ram. Just the camaraderie of these guys. You know, I visit, when I'm not at work, I visit, you know, Kenny at Wingman, Morgan at the Tacoma, and it's, uh, 
It's just uh, getting to know these guys and having them all in one room, sharing ideas. Uh, it's, it's an awesome feeling, you know, because they're, they're more than just brewers, they're my friends. Yeah, oh, I think this event here is awesome today. Um, it's kind of, I think it's kind of a rare thing. I've never heard of something like this, so when I heard about it, I definitely jumped on that. Um, <laughs> the Pink Boots, uh, so there's a Pink Boots Society, which is um, any woman who is in the industry that is making some of their income off of beer can join the Pink Boots Society. They're real steel-toed work boots. These are what I wear when I brew. <laughs> I, I see for us it goes beyond uh, the beer. Um, Tacoma loves Tacoma. Uh, Tacoma people love Tacoma businesses. And what I would like to see and, and to be a part of is a growing committee of just um, artisans, whether it be um, you know, cheese or um, uh, just art in general, anything. I'd like to build that kind of spirit in Tacoma where we can have um, local artisans get together and, and, and build business and, and community. Unlike a lot of other industries, the craft beer industry is not really competitively oriented. Total, we make up maybe like 10% of the market share for beer sold in the U.S. So we're not really competing with each other. We're mostly competing with the larger breweries, um, the big domestics. So they're the ones that we see as competitors, not really each other. And when we get together, all the brewers in Tacoma, it's the same kind of thing where people are like, oh, how does this work on your system? Or how do you do this? Or how do you get that to happen? And uh, it, I think it makes beer better for everybody. Super fun. And uh, we get to do the thing that we really like to do, which is screw around and uh, drink beer and make beer. My name is Diane Hansen. I'm a glass artist and public art sculptor working in Tacoma, Washington. I have a family history with the Swiss. My grandparents met here. It has this wonderful European strong feel to it. There's a good energy here. There's incredible artwork on the wall. And then when you walk in, the industrial nature of the building, the bricks, and just a really relaxed, casual space. I really like to work with the community as an artist, and I like to get them involved. Being able to sit back and watch how people interact with each other, what's meaningful, and how I can bring them together is really important to me as an artist. The Swiss is really wonderful about supporting local artists, showing their work. It's a great place to spend a day <laughs> or a night. <laughs> My name is Jason Skipper and I'm a writer. A couple of years ago, I published my first novel, Hustle. I'm currently working on a memoir slash biography of my father. Something that inspires my work is running. I often encounter interesting people. I'm inspired by the landscape. I just never know what's going to happen on one of those runs that can inspire a story. Running allows me to visualize scenes or chapters that I might be working on that are giving me trouble. It allows me to anchor myself in the setting, think about the characters, and go through dialogue in a way that there's not so much pressure that I feel when I'm sitting at the desk. It allows me to detach away from that. I'm drawn to characters from working class backgrounds. I think that there is a certain vulnerability that comes from being in a certain socioeconomic place. But I also really appreciate the way that communication works, the mannerisms of people from working class backgrounds and the sense of humor and the unique sense of beauty that these people find in unique places. 
And I see a lot of that in the people of Tacoma. And when I'm out on my run, I encounter situations that remind me of that. story ultimately needs to have a point. And this is the difference between that relative who goes on and on and on, even about maybe exciting experiences, but it doesn't go anywhere because it doesn't have a point. Now regardless of what your perspective might be spiritually or religious, to love one's enemy is maybe perhaps uh, the hardest thing to figure out how to do uh, in one's life. Stories were a way to create meaning out of our experiences. And we did that by giving it a beginning, a middle, and an end. First something happened, then something else happened, and as a result of that, we know this. Those are the key elements that you, you have to have in a story. And what I find most often I'm working with people is that, and because of that, it's the moral of the story, it's the point of the story, it's the lesson of the story, Thank you. it's the reason to be told. So right now, across the country, small towns everywhere there are teenagers engaged in a war it's a war against boredom with the eye when we're reading we can follow details you can jump in and out of time in fact we delight with that because we've seen it and we remember it when you're reading a book you can go on one page and then you go back to the other page when you're reading an article in a newspaper you can who is that again and you go up and you check there's not a linear aspect really to the written word that's the beauty of it the oral tradition has to be linear. The ear cannot capture that. The ear cannot keep track of all those details. <laughs> it's funny because when you grow up in Memphis, a trip to Alaska, it's basically like traveling internationally. In fact, I'm pretty sure we packed our passports because my mom was convinced that it was possible that we could get stuck in Canada. <laughs> when we're listening to stories, what we're doing is we're adding up all the details, again, looking for a point. That's how our brain works. So with an oral story, you have to be far more strict than you would even with writing to only include the details that matter. What the ear does have is a capacity to interpret tone. It was like Republican or more Republican were kind of my two. It was like own a gun or carry a gun into McDonald's. I love telling tragic stories that make people laugh straight up tone. That's something that's much harder to do in writing. You need a whole lot more words to capture tone than you do in oral storytelling. That's why you can eliminate details. You can cut out big swaths of things because in the space of me saying, and then he walked in the room. Totally different than if you're reading it. You can't get that beep, 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 beep. That, that's where oral storytelling rises above and I think stakes its own place in the art form of storytelling and even, even literature in that way. Maybe I can just not get a passport and then I won't have to leave. Okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're just not gonna get a passport. It's a great plan. 16 years old, it's a great plan. So that was ultimately what I wanted to do with Drunken Telegraph was to just establish a culture of storytelling. It's purely the practice of telling our stories, and I think even more listening to our stories, creating a space where it's fun to listen, and where you know that you're not gonna be stuck with that relative who never makes a point. You're gonna be talking with people who live in your community, and you're gonna hear a story that goes somewhere. Thank you.